If you open up your Bible on the first page and start reading, you see the Holy Spirit. If you open up your Bible on the last page, you start reading, you see the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Revelation 22-17, the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take, des- desires take the water of life without price. On the first page of your Bible, and on the last page of your Bible, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is considered one of the seven pillars in Ephesians 4 that creates unity. And uh, the Bible specifically calls our unity the unity of the Spirit. And so suffice to say, the Holy Spirit is fairly important, is it not? Fundamental to who we are. And it deserves study as we are disciples of God's Word. However, there is some difficulty in understanding the Holy Spirit. I think, let's just be honest, sometimes it can get a little bit of a complicated topic for multiple reasons. I think the first is that it doesn't have any human imagery, right? Whenever we're talking about God the Father, a lot of the times He portrays Himself with anthropomorphic features, right? Where He describes Himself as if He, as if he is a human, talking, you know, because God gets mad. Well, we understand what it's like to get mad. Or God talks about His... His hand over us. Does God literally have a physical hand? No, but he uses those features to kind of understand. Jesus himself, he became human, so he's very easy to understand. But the Spirit doesn't really have much human imagery. A lot of the times he's more symbolized by things like fire or oil or water or even a dove. And to be completely honest, a lot of throughout Christian history, the Spirit hasn't been focused on that much. There has been a big focus on Jesus and how He is and who He is, and that's worthy of study. But there have been times in the past where the Spirit has kind of been neglected, right? And so one of the problems is that there is such extremely different interpretations of the Holy Spirit. You know, some some churches will focus all about the Holy Spirit, and other churches won't mention Him Almost at all. Some churches say, or some people will say, that the Holy Spirit is all about how you feel. And others will say, well, no, it's just about the Bible. Or He indwells us. Is that figurative? Is that literal? How does the Spirit work in our lives? It's very difficult. And there's a little bit of confusion, especially since how the Spirit worked at one point may be different than how the Spirit works today. And another problem is, is that the information is kind of scattered. Right? There's not really a single book where I can look at it and say, oh, here's the Holy Spirit. In our Bible class, we've been going through Hebrews. And Hebrews is really touching how Jesus is both God and man. And in one central location, just a couple of chapters, you have such a good explanation of who Jesus is. But you really don't have that with the Spirit. When you're trying to find out who the Spirit is, you're kind of all over the place in the Bible. And so... Jesus made this interesting connection in John chapter 3 about the Holy Spirit, making this connection between spirit and wind. He said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it come from, comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. There's that connection with the Holy Spirit and wind. And wind is kind of a mysterious topic, isn't it? Especially in ancient days. Maybe we have a better understanding of it now scientifically. But what in the world is wind? What makes wind go here or go there? You can't see wind. Wind is invisible. What do you see? You see the effects of wind. You hear it. You feel it. And you see the leaves shaking in the trees. And Jesus is saying, that's how the, that's how the Holy Spirit is. He's a little bit mysterious. You don't see it, but you see the effects of it. And so today I just kind of want to establish a couple of points to help us open up our minds and consider the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is alive, and the Holy Spirit is God. And I go, as I go through these two points, it's going to be a little bit of an overview. Like I said, the, the, the scriptures on the Spirit, they're all over the place. So I might just be a little bit all over the place this morning, and not in a central text like I like to do most of the time. So the first thing I want to establish is that the Holy Spirit is alive and not a divine force or presence. And every time I think about the Holy Spirit, uh, you nerds will appreciate this, I think about the Star Wars. You know, in Star Wars, 
What do you have? You have the force. That is that metaphysical, ubiquitous power, right? Obi-Wan Kenobi says, the force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. And in that universe, right, you have characters that are sensitive to the Force, and the Jedi like to become one one with the Force, right? They want to match their wills to the wills of the Force, right? The Sith, they're the ones that use the Force for their desires and try to manipulate the Force, right? And I admit, there are some really good parallels between the Force and Star Wars and the Holy Spirit. That would make an excellent, I don't know, kids event or VBS or something like that. Tom, write that down. But one of the biggest differences between the Force and the Holy Spirit is that the Force isn't alive. You understand, there's not Star Wars, you have this Force, and it's like this mystical, mysterious power that everyone's tapping into. And sometimes I feel like we as Christians, we might get to the point where we start talking about the Holy Spirit like that. Like, uh, uh, what do they say? May the Force be with you. Or i got to tap into the Force to have these powers. Or the Force is telling us something. And sometimes I feel like we treat the Holy Spirit like that. When the truth is, when you come to God's Word, the Holy Spirit is a person. When I say a person, I mean a, 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 a being that is rational, self-conscious, that thinks, that feels, that wills, right? He is a person in the sense that He has a personality. And sometimes we get to this mistake of thinking the Holy Spirit is just kind of God's presence or God's power. Does the Holy Spirit have power? Yes. If the Holy Spirit is there, is it God's presence? Yes. But the Holy Spirit is actually alive. You see in God's Word the Spirit acting, thinking, being acted against. You see the Holy Spirit being active. In the Old Testament, you see the Holy Spirit Genesis 1, he moved on the face of the waters. Job 33, Job talks about how the Holy Spirit was there in creating the world and how the Holy Spirit helped create the world. And in Exodus 31 and in other passages, sometimes the Holy Spirit worked through people who were crafting, like when they were crafting the tabernacle, crafting the temple. The Holy Spirit worked through these men, not to speak through them, but to work through them. And, and there were times whenever the Holy Spirit would work through the leaders, like Joshua who was mighty in spirit, or Moses, or David, or Elijah, or Zechariah, and all these different prophets and leaders. But the greatest work of the Holy Spirit has always been and will always be speaking through people. David said, the Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. And as you read your Bible, you're going to see glimpses of the Spirit here or there and here and there. And he's just, he's just all over the place. It's like he's always there, but he's never at the front, never in the spotlight. And you know it, it, what it really reminds me of? In high school, I did a lot of theater. And at one point, I was considering it as a profession, and I decided I probably didn't want to do that. The Holy Spirit reminds me of the stagehands. Whenever you're in the middle of a play, right? Whenever you're transitioning from one scene to another, you have the blackout, the curtain, the stagehands come on, and what do they do? They, they set up the scene. They set up all the furniture to create the scene. In between the scenes, they move all the furniture. They move it back. Whenever, whenever you're there and you forget a line, the stagehand is there with a copy of the script giving you the, giving you the line if you forget it. If something needs to be done behind the scenes, it was the stage hands. And I just, I think that's a good metaphor for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always there, always around, always doing things, but never in the limelight. He's always supporting the people who go into the limelight. Whether that person is the prophet who goes and speaks and the Spirit's over there whispering lines into his ear, or, or, or the, when Jesus comes up on stage and he's the main character and he's in the limelight and the Spirit is there helping to make sure everything gets done and everything is going smoothly. That's what the Holy Spirit does throughout the Bible. And then you go to the New Testament, you see the same thing, right? Whenever Jesus became human, the Holy Spirit formed a little baby Jesus in the womb. Or whenever Jesus is baptized, you have one of those times where the Spirit is actually in the limelight and the Spirit falls upon Jesus like a dove. 
You have the Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And He works a lot in enabling the, all these incredible miracles. All that power comes from somewhere, and it's the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit working in the body of Jesus and resurrecting Him after He was dead. He had the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophets. Again, the greatest role that the, that the Spirit had is speaking through the prophets. Jesus said to them, said to His disciples, Whenever you get into this big trial, whether it's a king or a judge, and you have to explain who you are and what you believe, he said, do not even worry, because the Spirit's going to speak through you. It's not going to be your words, it's going to be the Spirit's. And even today, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit today and in our lives, he does a great bit. He does a lot. And it's always behind the scenes. The Spirit renews the spirits of those who are saved, regenerating, giving life. When we are baptized, we are reborn, and that birth is of water and what? Spirit. Spirit dwells in us Christians. It helps us to, what Romans says, mortify the deeds of the flesh, to repent of works, to, tr to strive to live by the Spirit, to live righteously. When we're praying, the Holy Spirit reads our hearts and delivers that to God. And so that when we mess up in our prayers, it doesn't make a difference. He helps us in doing good, right? The fruits of the Spirit... Right? Those are good things. Living righteously in the Spirit works in us to produce those fruits. And at the end, He will resurrect our bodies. And again, the biggest function of the Holy Spirit is to speak through the prophets. And He speaks today through Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. And in all these things the Spirit does, it shows the Spirit is alive. He's not some impersonal force. He's not some impersonal presence, inanimate being like the, like the force in Star Wars. The Spirit is conscious. And I think this is a good Scripture to show it. And I, I think this is a really cool Scripture. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. I read this passage and I'm like, wow, this is cool. This is a unique idea, right? And these two verses, what do you got? You have the Spirit searching, you have the Spirit comprehending, and I think this is a good kind of overall verse to show the function of the Spirit. So you got God's mind, right? God's thoughts. And you know, how deep is God's mind? Oh, it's an infinite well. There is no end to God's mind, right? And yet the Spirit is able to search the depths of God, digging through all those depths. I, what, what a unique idea. I'm like, that is so cool. And, and, and he makes the connection, like, you yourself, what knows your thoughts? No one knows your thoughts except your own spirit, right? Your spirit is you but it's also kind of not you, but it is you, and it knows your, your thoughts. Same way with God. The Spirit is God, and it knows His thoughts, right? And that infinite mind of God, the Spirit is searching through the mind of God, and whenever the Spirit delivers a message to the prophets, and the prophets deliver it to the people, first, the Spirit goes through the mind of God, grabs all these truths, searches through that infinite depth, grabs this message, gives it to the prophets, the prophets speak it, and we hear it and read it today. I think that's awesome. And this shows the Spirit is conscious. The Spirit is one with God. The Spirit is unique in that He can peer into the mind of God, the infinite mind of God. This is not like the Force in Star Wars, right? Because in Star Wars, you have you know Luke Skywalker trying to learn how to manipulate the Force, but the Force was already there. You just had to tap into it and work in it. That's not how the Spirit is. The Spirit works in you. You're not manipulating the Spirit. The Spirit's manipulating you. We work hand in hand with the Spirit. The Spirit has this agenda. The Holy Spirit wants you to produce the fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit wants something. 
And so we, he wants us to do good works, to think on the thoughts that came out of God's mind, to live in a holy way, to pray to God. And we are not tapping into the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. We're working with the Holy Spirit. We're walking in tandem with the Holy Spirit. We're walking hand in hand, getting on the same page as the Holy Spirit as He works in us. That's why there are several passages in the Bible that talk about working against the Holy Spirit. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You can resist the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can lie to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is alive and He's trying to work in you, but it is your choice whether you let Him work in you or not. The Spirit is not just this ambiguous energy, a mysterious power. He is a being that acts, that thinks, He's rational, and He wants to work in you. You know, my second point is the question of the Holy Spirit, is it God? This concept of the Trinity, right? And we have to ask ourselves, just because it's a common Christian idea out there doesn't necessarily mean it's true. We have to come to our Bible and ask, is this true? Is this what the Bible teaches? That you have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. They're all unique individuals, but at the same time, they are one. Is this biblical? And the more I search my Bible, the more I think it is true. Even though the word Trinity doesn't show up in your Bible, it's a biblical concept. And so it's fairly easy to say, okay, the Father is God, no doubt. The Son is God. There's plenty of scriptures that prove that. But the Spirit is God. Okay, this one may be a little bit more difficult, but I still think we can do it. I just want to go through it real quick. The Spirit is identified with God. There are so many times where it says the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There are several scriptures that say this, like this right here, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit we be with you all. You see all three right there, this triplet that often shows up a lot. Now let me, maybe you're saying, well, that doesn't prove he's God. Well, let me say this. What if, what if, I, what if I were to say this? Well, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of of Peter be with you all. Does that sound right? No. What about the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship of Martin Luther be with you all? That doesn't sound right. The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship of Alexander Campbell be with you all. That doesn't sound right. The fellowship of Bobby be with you all. That sounds good. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. no. But, but see, this triplet, who, who deserves to be in that third slot? Seriously. Who deserves to be listed along with the Father and the Son? No one. It's kind of like, you know how Jesus, Philippians 2 says Jesus is equal with God. Who can be equal with God? The answer is no one except God himself. That's the point. So Jesus must be God. And so when you have Father, Son, Spirit, and you got the third slot, who can stand alongside the Father and Son? Only God himself. This is the only thing that makes sense. I mean, to be listed in that third slot, that's kind of like holy ground, right? And this is the one I really like to go to most of the time. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice the word name, singular. There is one name with three beings. You know, I don't know how it works out, but somehow, some way, God doesn't make sense, does he? One plus one plus one equals... One. Father, the Son, the Spirit share a single name, and that name is God. The Holy Spirit is often identified as God. There are times whenever it says, you know, like Luke 1, God spoke through the prophets. Well, and then Peter says, well, the Spirit spoke through the prophets. Well, is that a contradiction? No, the Spirit is God. Or there are times whenever Isaiah says, the voice of the Lord says the people won't listen, right? They're going to hear, but they're not going to understand. They're going to see, but they're, not, they're going to be blind. And then Paul comes along and he says, you know, the Holy Spirit says the people won't listen. It's like, Paul, did you just make a mistake? It actually says the voice of the Lord. Well, actually, the Holy Spirit and the Lord are one and the same. And then you have very clear passages like 2 Corinthians 3.18 that says the Spirit is Lord. You have Acts 5. This one's a pretty good, very simple. You want to prove the Holy Spirit is God. Go to Matthew 28.19 or Acts 5. In this passage, you have Ananias and Sapphira. Everyone is selling their possessions 
and giving the money to the church. They're deciding, we don't need all this wealth. We're going to give it to a good cause. We're going to give it to the church, and the church is going to spread the gospel with this money. Ananias and Sapphira jump on the bandwagon. They decide, we're going to sell our possessions and give the money to the church. But what they did was, they sold it, and they said they're giving all the money to the church when they didn't give all the money to the church. They kept some of it back. Now, they didn't have to give all the money to the church, but the truth is that they're lying. And so Peter looks at Ananias, and with the Holy Spirit's gift, he's able to see into the heart, and he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part, of your, part for yourself Keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land, right? You kept part of the money, and you're lying about it. He says, verse 5, verse 4, you have not lied to man, but to God. With a single lie... He lied to the Holy Spirit and to God. Why? Because they are one in the same. The Holy Spirit is God. And then you can also talk about the qualities of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does things and has things that only God can possess. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The only thing that is eternal is God having no beginning. Meaning before God even said, let there be light, the Spirit was there. If the Spirit didn't have a beginning and didn't have an end... It's God. The Spirit is omniscient. If it can peer into the infinite mind of God, it must have an infinite mind itself. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent. It helped create the world. That requires ultimate power. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. David wrote in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? And and where where can I go flee from your spirit? And the answer is you can't. And then there's the idea that if the Spirit's in me, the Spirit's in you, the Spirit's in you, the Spirit's in you, and the Spirit has the ability to be everywhere. That's a quality only God has. The Spirit is called holy. The only thing that is inherently holy is God. The Spirit gives life. Only God can give life. The Spirit forgives of sin. Only God can forgive of sin. And so you just compile this list of arguments, this list of qualities, this list of roles and functions of the Holy Spirit, and you're left with this realization, He's God. Right? And you ask that question, why does it matter? Well, in order to worship God, you have to know who God is. Jesus said in John chapter 4, those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That, first, that second quality, truth. What is the truth of God? The truth is who God is. The truth is that God is the Father who gave us His Son to die for our sins so that we might receive forgiveness and God the Spirit. The Spirit of worship. The Spirit, when we get together on Sundays or, and we worship God throughout the week, our Spirit is supposed to work alongside with God's Spirit. God's Spirit works in our spirit. And so we worship God in truth, knowing who He is, and in spirit from an honest heart that the Holy Spirit works in. We are supposed to let God's Spirit work in our spirit so that we can walk by the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is extremely important when we are trying to seek God, when we're trying to understand God, when we're trying to understand how and why we are saved. The Holy Spirit, God's Word says, is the greatest gift anyone could receive. After Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father... He poured out the Spirit on the whole world. And now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now, like the Scripture reading this morning, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. With how important the Holy Spirit is in God's plan, we have to take time to understand who He is, to understand what He does for us. Because the Holy Spirit is God in every way. In the same way that the Father is God, that the Son is God, the Spirit is God. He possesses all the qualities of being God. He does all the works God can do. And yet all three, Father, Son, Spirit, somehow, some way, I don't know, don't ask me, they're God. But at the same time, the Spirit is active 
alive, thinking, doing, feeling. And as you read your Bible, you see the Holy Spirit being that stagehand who works behind the curtain, behind the scenes, who's always making sure things go smoothly, whispering into the ears of the prophets to tell them what to do, moving things in such a way that God's purpose is accomplished. Sometimes the Spirit spoke through people, sometimes He worked through people, and sometimes He led people. And today, what does He do? He speaks to us in God's Word. His words, they transform us, and they cause us to lead a life of holiness. Those Jedis, I keep going back to those Jedis. Star Wars is cool. Not as cool as God, but pretty cool. Those Jedis were able to do cool things with the Spirit. When they actually worked in tandem, they were able to do things. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit's going to let us shoot lightning from our hands. That'd be cool, but that's not what God wants us to do. But the Spirit is going to give you the power to do incredible things. Things that you thought you would not be able to do. Things that you thought would be impossible for people who felt like they had no hope. Spirit will give you hope. For people who thought that they couldn't change, that they were destined to live sinful lives, the Spirit can change you and transform you. For people who know how strong Satan is and know how hard it is to say no, the Spirit can give you the strength to say no. For people who thought they would never be saved, the Spirit can save you. And that's why the greatest gift you will ever receive is the Holy Spirit. Because to have the Holy Spirit is to be saved. All of that comes from the Spirit. And so my ending message is a little nerdy, but that, that's because I'm a nerd. May the Spirit be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, May the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. So give me a little freedom to say, May the Spirit be with you. I love you all. Thank you guys for listening. My message this morning is to receive the Spirit. And I ask you, do you have the Spirit?